just be aware of that. So we are going now to the next speaker, Donald Tomalia. He's a CEO founder of Nanosyntons, National Dendrimer and Nanotechnology Center in the US. Um, he did his PhD in physical organic chemistry from Michigan, Michigan University uh, while working at Dow Chemical. And he founded three Dendrimer-based nanotechnology companies, namely Nanosyntons, Dendritic Nanotechnologies, and Dendritech Incorporated. He is uh, one of these pioneering scientists and inventors that uh, drove the whole uh, field of Dendrimer research. And he got a number of awards uh, for this early work, uh, starting already in 1986, uh, giving his first first awards and one of the interesting rewards, the Leonardo da Vinci Award, which is quite uh, indicative of the, the way he's, uh, he's working, he received in 1996. And he was also inducted into the Thomas Reuters Hall of Citation Laureates in Chemistry, and he's uh, definitely one of the top most cited scientists in chemistry today. So. We're very happy to have you here, Donald. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me back here again to this beautiful city and this most stimulating conference. Uh, before I get into the story, uh, I'd like to add there are people in the audience like uh, Lou Balag, who were actually were a part of this uh, history, uh, uh, much of which I'll talk about in the next few minutes. And uh, there may be others out there, and there are some who are currently sharing in things we're doing in this uh, very exciting uh, area of um, well-defined nanoparticles, so well-defined that physicists are calling them superatoms. And uh, we'll give you a little bit of the background on why and where they're coming from on that. Uh, but before I get into the actual story, I'd like to always show this picture uh, because I carry the map of my state of Michigan with me right here in the palm of my hand, and we're in the middle of that palm, uh, hand palm, and uh, it gets very cold up there in the wintertime, so we get to do a lot of really good research because there's not much else to do out of doors. But that was standing, uh, we have focused on several, uh, a, a, a two major classes of well-defined nanoparticles, those that uh, may be referred to as organic or soft nanoparticles, and, uh, and the other class being the inorganic or hard nanoparticles. And uh, these materials, uh, as you hopefully will see in this short uh, presentation, uh, are indeed intriguing because they can mimic atoms by having beautiful magic number type stoichiometries when they combine under the right conditions. However, the real key is they have to be made cleanly. They have to be made well. And that's one of the issues that nanotechnology has been uh, struggling with. How do we make reproducible, well-defined, monodispersed particles? Having said that, uh, the major universities, we always have external academic uh, collaborations. And the major universities we've been interacting with this past year have been Hopkins, uh, VCU, the University of Pennsylvania, and the University of Oods. Now, what does this all mean, this business of well-defined, uh, quantized uh, 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 building blocks? It really goes back to uh, the periodicity that not, did not just start with Mendeleev and atoms, but there is periodicity all the way back to subatomic particles, which the physicists know a lot about, and I confess I know less about. However, what amazed me is that this periodicity has a unique way of being transferred from one hierarchical level, from the atomic level to the molecular level. We know how precisely and beautifully we can make molecules. In fact, many of our pharma, many of our drugs are based on this beautiful preservation of these six parameters here, size, surface chemistry, their shapes, their composition, et cetera. In fact, the traditional pharmacy people always work with, whether they realize it or not, these six very important critical hierarchical design parameters. When they are at the atomic level, they are called critical atomic design parameters. At the molecular level, they're CMDPs. At the nano level, CNDPs. And we're beginning to see them develop even up at the micro level. 
It was a roughly a year ago now that Ben Fidel from Karolinska Institute heard part of this story and asked us to write an article, a, an invited review article for the Journal of Internal Medicine to try to share this story with physicians. So it appeared in the Journal of Internal Medicine and I'm now beginning to get some very beautiful contacts, wonderful contacts from physicians because these very amazing periodic properties that I'm trying to describe to you were touched on by Patrick Hunziger this morning when he said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had predictable patterns so that we didn't have to make thousands of compounds to find the very best one? And that's literally what we're trying to do here now with these uh, uh, particular uh, concepts. It was roughly three years ago, I, many in this audience, particularly Lou knows that I have been thinking about this so-called Dendemers behave like atoms for at least a couple of decades. But it was only three years ago, after I was invited to give an, a lecture before the American Physics Society in Boston, that I found out the physicists have a parallel world. They have been working in the um, literally the same concept, but with all inorganic materials, and they've been referring to these entities as superatoms. We were literally calling them nano-elements in our particular concept, but now we've come to agreement, and since then we have, uh, I think I, I'm giving as many physics talks now on this subject as I am chemistry, because the physicists really are excited about this, because they are making predictions with these periodic property patterns that they could not make before. And I'm here to tell you this morning, I want to see this, these predictions move into the nanomedicine area and in fact, this very first uh, publication that came out this past year is a first, our first effort in that direction. Having said that, how we, we need to consider this all in the context of more practical things in life, namely, how do we get our nanoparticles, our nanotherapies through the FDA, FDA approval process? We know it is going to, they are going to involve either, either hard or soft nanoparticles, we know they're going to be based on structure control and the ability to engineer those features so that we can get through at least these very first two difficult hurdles. The first one, of course, is safety. That, by definition, implies nanotoxicity. And in fact, that's what many of our nanoperiodic property patterns are allowing us to do, and that is to predict toxicity, not only based on surface chemistry, but combinations of surface chemistry with sizes, with shapes, and with uh, other uh, architectural features. And then, of course, the very important feature is efficacy. How does one use the techniques that medicinal chemists, that pharmaceutical companies have used for decades to optimize using QSAR, quantitative structure activity relationships. How can we utilize that kind of a protocol to optimize our nanomaterials? And of course, this comes later after we pass the first two hurdles. Uh, although these lists are not complete, I would like to just show you some active materials in the clinical phase uh, both this and this particular slide, these are hard nanoparticles. These are, this is not ex uh, an exhaustive list. It's just to show you uh, uh, the nomenclature we use for naming these categories as well as two, that, uh, two nanoparticles, hard particles, that are in the clinical activity uh, area. This afternoon, we'll just focus on a couple of high-profile examples in the soft nanoparticle area, and they are all either approved nanomedications or they are two of the top contending uh, nanotherapies uh, that are either in phase one or fa one of the phases between one and three. It so happens that Vivagel is in phase three, as a very active antiviral against bacterial vaginosis. And BIND, I believe, is going into phase two as a very um, effective vector for delivering cancer therapies. Vivagel is based uh, solely on dendimers. BIND is based solely on 
this S3 or polymeric micelles, whereas a braxane is based on not a material synthesized by humans, but a material made by nature, namely a protein, an albumin. So a braxane really had the advantage from the start because nature solved a lot of the problems that we have to deal with when we go about manufacturing and synthesizing them uh, with our mortal uh, means and capabilities. Having said that, how do we engineer these CNDPs to optimize uh, our, our uh, uh, nano candidates for in vivo nanotherapeutics? And I go back to these six critical nanoscale design parameters. They literally can be looked at as sectors of a hexagon, six areas that one can look at in a very systematic manner, and in fact, the literature is beginning to fill up with many beautiful examples. One of the best I like to cite is in the size area and how it relates to excretion. Uh, at least a couple of decades ago, uh, as, uh, through a collaboration I had with uh, Paul Lauderbert, the Nobel laureate in MRI, we found real time with our dendimer contrast agents that the sizes either determined whether they went to the kidney very quickly or they ended up in the spleen or the liver. We could see it in real time. So nearly 20 years ago, we had one of our first nanoperiodic property patterns based on size for dendimers. And it was difficult to convince people how important it really could be, but now others, those working with quantum dots and silica uh, nanoparticles have observed very similar size and, and to some degree surface chemistry features that determine excretion modes. That's incredibly important to get through the FDA appro approval process. Another important area is shape. Uh, Costarellis and others in the UK have shown that uh, long, skinny, or uh, cylindrical uh, nano objects will penetrate deeper and have totally different flow properties compared to spheroids and, and other shapes, and they in turn have their own individual periodic property patterns that are allowing many to predict. One of the most exciting developments lately involves a property that has been uh, of periodic properties that we're beginning to see in the area of surface chemistry. Dendermers, by definition, can be modified with nearly 1,000 different surface chemistries. And among these many surface chemistries we've looked at, one of them, a proprietary material, uh, was examined by uh, an expert sitting here in this room on complement activation. And that's Professor Moeen Mogimi. Mogimi, in a collaboration with uh, my group and others at Copenhagen and the Cosmophos project, has found a surface chemistry that looks to be, and I can't talk about it, equivalent to, if not better, than PEG. So surface chemistry, I am certain, will be playing a, an amazingly important role in the very near future as some of these uh, results are published and allowed to go public. I could go on and on about patterns in all of these other six areas, but time doesn't allow me. Having said that, I've tried to take those six areas and color code what were the assets and what are the downsides of both the hard nanoparticles and the soft. The hard nanoparticles have, in general, more engineering problems and more uh, issues to deal with compared to the soft. But among the soft that we'll talk about this afternoon are uh, Abraxane, as I've already indicated, nature has taken care of literally all of the six issues with the exception of surface chemistry is limited and the problem of size. The uh, Viva Gel is... Uh, 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 probably the only uh, material based on dendermers, of course, which really can be engineered in all six categories. And very quickly, I want to take you through what were the steps in optimizing this. The Star Pharma people found they had to bind a very important region on all viral particles, and they needed 
a high multiplicity of anionic clusters, and it had to be a particular size, and it had to have a certain hydrophobicity, and by doing the QSAR that I talked about, they were able to pick out the very best, best candidate that is now in phase three clinical, SPL7013. The second area that they were able to optimize was the notion of, as a topical drug, they did not want it to penetrate, and as such, they looked at these patterns that are shown here in a very primitive form and found that the hydrophobic uh, nature as well as the size was very important in, for the success of Vivagel as a topical agent that is in phase three against bacterial vaginosis. And of course, the structure they ended up with is shown here, where they've combined the multivalent anionic cluster characteristics with the exact size they needed to cover the binding region on the viral coats and the hydrophobic presentation of sulfonates as anions, and that led them, and it's a polylysine denimer, generation three, and that led them to their phase three clinicals, which I expect they're going to be completing in the very near future. As a final wrap-up now, the bind technology now has a few more problems. And the Star Pharma, these are not my data, these are the Star Pharma data, and this is the next to last slide, so uh, I'll go through it quite quickly. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, Dendermer people were able to engineer all of these parameters shown here to give them distinct advantages compared to the many uh, engineerable but other disadvantages that poly, uh, polymeric mice cells present. One of the mo probably most uh, negative uh, features of polymeric micelles is you cannot make them any smaller than roughly 20 to 30 nanometers and we are beginning to find that for cancer therapy and deep penetration one needs to be able to go to much lower and smaller dimensions. So many of these advantages as you see here have been engineered according to the protocol I just described to you by the very capable people in Melbourne and in Monash University in Australia. And I think their efforts will soon pay off as they make it through the phase three. Having said that, the final message is we're just imitating what the traditional pharmaceutical people have been doing with small molecules. We're simply applying it in the context and then with new protocols to larger systems that are not as well controlled as these molecular structures were here, or that of bramanite, or the albumin uh, that uh, uh, was controlled by uh, the protein formation and has shown up in a very successful and approved uh, product called Abramin, uh, Abramax. Having said that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, this very short list here of people that I've had some important discussions with. and. Uh, and point out that if none of this made sense, just Google Tamalia nanoperiodic and you'll see more, or look at this Journal of Internal Medicine article or the eighth chapter in our book on dendimers. This uh, page over here shows you how we are able to make PAMAM dendimers that are literally as clean and as pure as the proteins that are braminites, as uh, really uh, uh, an example of. And so I think that is another issue that all of us will have to deal with. How do we consistently and reproducibly make these nanoparticles accordingly, according to the specifications that we find are most optimum for these therapies? And I want to thank you, and I'm probably over a little bit.